Good afternoon, good evening, and welcome to the closing session of Development in Climate Days 2021. We are absolutely delighted to have all of you here with us today. My name is Karina Bachofen. I'm Associate Director at the Red Cross Red Crescent Climate Center, and I have the pleasure of moderating today's session. On behalf of all Development and Climate Days partners, thank you so much for being here now, and thank you so much for all of your part participation over the last two days. It's been an absolutely amazing experience to see everybody come together and to show that we can do this virtually and that we can still have interesting, provocative, lively conversations cutting across all sorts of sectors and themes and levels from the local to the global, all of it together here at DNC Days. As some of you may know, this was our first ever virtual edition of DNC Days. This was decided long ago before we knew if we could be in person or not. We said, let's try it. Let's keep the spirit of DNC Days alive. And we have done it. And I would like to just maybe kick off with a few stats, which we find quite exciting um, about how Development and Climate Days has developed over the last two days. We've had a record number, earth shattering, 1,420 registrations for DNC Days. This is more than double of what we normally get when we're face to face. Um, we have had over 780 participants joining us over the last two days. That, of course, excludes this session right now. And these participants have come from 127 countries. So I find that incredibly impressive. And we really set out to make this DNC Days the most inclusive, the most far reaching uh, DNC Days yet. And I hope that um, those statistics are a testament of what we feel has really been uh, reflected in very rich discussions. Um, just out of interest, the early warning, early action theme proved to be the most popular in terms of number of participants. And we did have nearly 2000 interactions on Twitter and that's both tweets and likes and retweets and the rest of it. And so that sets a little bit the scene of um, how we've managed DNC Day so far. Of course, um, were we in person, this closing session would be all about having an informal discussion, talking about what's going on on the ground and how it's linking to the negotiations at COP. But really, you know, we come here and we really like to bring emphasis on lived experience, local knowledge, and what we all have to offer as experts. A couple of years ago at Development and Climate Days, Lee Mel Hook said, you know, there should be an inside out COP where the voices of those most affected, those on the front lines, those doing the work um, are in the center and the negotiations and negotiators are on the outside doing their work. And um, I think at DNC Days, we are able to leave these formalities, technicalities, the process behind and really focus on what matters. We like to bring together a range of voices, ideas, have them be debated and really try to help new connections be brokered between individuals and organizations. And if you just take a look at the live blog on our uh, website, you will have a snapshot of what's been happening. We've had um, active networking spaces as well. So we've hope you've met some familiar faces and also met some new people along the way. So um, in the spirit of DNC days, I do want to shift gears a little bit. We are absolutely delighted to be able to have Felix Rugama and Mercedes Pineda from Nicaragua, who are here to start our discussions off today, really to ground us in the reality of a community, a community in Nicaragua called Mechapa. And Mercedes is here today. She is going to speak to us about her experience in her community confronting climate change. She's a member of the local committee of disaster prevention in the community of, as I mentioned, Mechapa. And she's accompanied by Felix Rugama Moreno, who is national coordinator of the project Enhancing Flood Resilience in Central America, which is part of the Zurich Flood Resilience Alliance, one of our supporters at DNC Days. I do want to let you all know, this is um, a, really a privilege to have Mercedes here, to be able to bring her to our discussions at COP and to be able to hear directly from, from, her, from her voice, her original voice, and what's been going on. Mercedes will be speaking in Spanish today. And I encourage all of us to really be active listeners. We're honoring the original voice. There's no translation. There's nothing that's been written for her. This is her story. 
But before I pass on to Mercedes, I would like to introduce Felix Rugama uh, from the uh, Flood Resilience Alliance to tell us a little bit more and set the context for Mercedes's words. Felix, over to you. Thank you, Karina. And hello, everyone. Uh, for all, it's a pleasure to be here talking to you. And as Karina said, uh, my name is Felix Rogama. I am from Nicaragua. I am the national coordinator of uh, the project Enhanced Flood Resilience. And um, yeah, we have been working here for more than three years. And uh, in Nicaragua, we are working in four communities. Uh, we are working with uh, a tool with measure the resilience of the communities. And today we are working or we are focused on one important topic that uh, we are working on, which is early warning systems. And to talk about it, uh, we are going back about 20 years when Mitch Hurricane came to Nicaragua. And that was a really difficult context because these communities didn't have any tool to, for example, to measure the quantity of water that was falling in those communities. These communities uh, didn't have any tool uh, to make uh, decisions and uh, when to move people from the risky zones to the safest zones. Uh, how to move the people, where to move the people. And uh, that was a really, really difficult context. All these communities uh, all around the country didn't have any early warning system. So make decisions for them was so, so difficult. And that was translated in so many deaths around the world. 20 years after uh, this break, came to these four communities. And now we have installed a four a early warning systems in these communities, a, which are connected. And the families in these communities now have a tool a, which generate data. And this data make an easy take decision for them. And the future Mercedes, we talk about it. And one thing that is important is the local key actors have access to this data because uh, the data that the early warning system generates can be read for the community, but also it is uploaded in the cloud uh, and the key actors have access to this data through a link. But also it's important because not just the key, uh, the local actor have access and also the national actor have access to this data. It means uh, they uh, are taking decision from the government and when to move people, how to move people. So uh, this is so important. We, we feel that like uh, we have generated a huge change in these communities. Uh, then you, you will uh, listen it from Mercedes, uh, but we are just working in four communities. Uh, the idea is to move forward to, to more communities around the country. But in Nicaraguan context, it's a little bit difficult for our socioeconomical situation. So we need the support from other countries. We need the support from donors to come to more and more communities and give more tools to more families and save more lives. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Felix. And Mercedes, um, we are delighted to hear from you. Mercedes, por favor. Mi nombre es Mercedes, soy miembro del Comité Local de Prevención y Atención de Desastre en mi comunidad. Hoy compartiré mi experiencia participando en el proyecto Aumentando la Resiliencia Ante Inundaciones, ejecutado por PLAN y la Alianza Resiliencia Ante Inundaciones. Mi experiencia se basa en el fortalecimiento de las capacidades de la comunidad a través del sistema de alerta temprana. Mi comunidad está ubicada en una zona de riesgo, ya que estamos cerca del mar. Hay un cruce de río y la geografía es plana. Esto 
hace que cuando llueve inundemos muy fácilmente. A lo largo de los años, en mi comunidad hemos experimentado muchos cambios por relación al clima. Por un lado, a veces experimentamos sequía y por otro lado, a veces experimentamos lluvias que nos provocan inundaciones. Esto está relacionado al avance de la agricultura, el uso excesivo de la deforestación con fines comerciales, así como los incendios forestales. Aquí eh, eso se basa a que también nos puede, nos ha presentado pues cambios bruscos en la temperatura, como tornados, tormentas de polvo, reducción de la disponibilidad del agua para el consumo humano, baja producción de la alimentación que conduce a la inseguridad alimentaria, efecto en la salud de las personas, en los medios de vida, daños a la infraestructura. En estos últimos años, las inundaciones se han producido con mayor frecuencia, ya que las características de mi comunidad tienen como resultado que nos inundemos con facilidad. Las causas son desinteresadas y eso nos genera muchos problemas en la salud. A finales del año 2018, Plan Internacional realizó un estudio basado en la herramienta de medición de resiliencia a inundaciones para conocer la situación de la comunidad. Sus principales resultados reflejaron que las comunidades no tenían forma o métodos para monitorear la lluvia no contaban con herramientas para predecir inundaciones y compartir información a través de los canales adecuados para su difusión y puesta en marcha de acciones efectivas para las familias de la comunidad. A partir del anterior Plan Internacional y el Instituto de Nicaragüense de Estudios Territoriales, INETER, se instalaron cuatro modernas estaciones meteorológicas este sistema de alerta temprana nos permite a la comunidad en relación a la lluvia a nivel comunitario. Hemos formado una red de observadores que tienen la intención de monitorear la información generada por la estación y compartirla con el Colopred para que podamos tomar una decisión acerca de cómo evacuar a las familias más afectadas a áreas más seguras. Otro aspecto importante es que este SAT permite a los actores nacionales como el INETER y actores locales como la alcaldía a monitorear digitalmente los datos generados y emitir algún tipo de ayuda a las comunidades, así como el envío de ayuda. Usamos estos datos meteorológicos de la comunidad para ponernos de acuerdo con las fuerzas navales, si es o no es seguro que las personas que se dedican a la pesca puedan salir o no a realizar su labor. Finalmente, me gustaría mencionar que necesitamos implementar proyectos dirigidos a fortalecer capacidades de desastre ambientales y de reducción de riesgo. Esto se está logrando en cierta medida. Por ejemplo, para mí este proyecto es eh, eh, bueno, ya que se estaba desarrollando en cuatro de las comunidades de mi región. Sería un poco más interesante si estas acciones pudieran llegar a más comunidades para, más, para seguir eh, fortaleciendo las capacidades de la materia del medio ambiente remanente al cambio climático y la gestión del riesgo de desastre. Los impactos del cambio climático son visibles y sus efectos son notables a todos los niveles para lograr compromisos globales. Creo que necesitaríamos fortalecer el trabajo conjunto entre la comunidad internacional y las comunidades nacionales y locales. Si todos nos unimos fuerza y nos enfocamos en una misma dirección, será más fácil lograr el compromiso global en materia al medio ambiente, el cambio climático y la gestión del riesgo de desastre. Como comunidad, vivimos con cambios extremos climáticos. Espero que los gobiernos reunidos en la COP de Glasgow me recuerden a mí y a mi comunidad mientras toman decisiones para nuestro mundo. 
necesitamos invertir más en sistemas de alerta temprana, ya que esto nos está salvando miles de vidas. Muchísimas gracias, Mercedes, por compartir su historia con nosotros hoy día. Thank you very much, Mercedes, for sharing your story with us today. It's, uh, I think, just really a moment for us to take and reflect and hear what you're saying about your community's experience, how your, you and your neighbors have been capacitated and empowered to take action and really to inform your own decisions on what actions you must take based on forecast information, on weather information, on early warning systems. And I think this really helps ground many of our discussions we've had over the last two days, for, particularly on early warning, early action. We also heard about the challenges of taking such systems that are working, as you say, to scale. And that's something that we've grappled with across many of the discussions in the themes. And of course, the need to connect the local to the global and to ensure that um, local solutions are informing global responses. Thank you very much, Mercedes, for being here today. And thank you very much, Felix, for providing context to our discussion. So, We've just take it, been taken to Nicaragua. We've just heard this story. And I would like to, with that grounding, take us now to development and climate days, to what we've discussed over the last two days across our five themes. We have um, a wonderful panel today that I've been, um, that I'll be delighted to introduce to you, um, who's going to sh share some reflections on what was discussed. We have asked all of our theme leads, so the leads of the early warning, early action theme, the climate finance theme, the resilient food and agriculture systems theme, nature-based solutions theme, and um, the urban systems theme to create their key messages, come up with them and turn them into newspaper headlines. What have we learned? What have we discussed? And if everything that we've discussed goes extremely well, how would that be reflected in a newspaper that we would pick up in 2030? What would be the headlines? And if things go catastrophically wrong and things just are completely off track more than ever before, and that's reflected in a headline, what would we see? So per theme, you will now see the headlines that have been derived from our discussions at Development and Climate Days. And I'll be delighted to invite our panelists to talk about each of these themes. Before we go there, I'd like to draw attention to the slide that's being uh, presented here, which is a cartoon that was recently come up with in a cartoonathon by the uh, Climate Center, where you see a group of people on the floor, rolling their sleeves up, using their crayons, the colored pencils, markers, and coming up with their vision of the future. And he says, no thanks, we're going to create some alternative options over here. Do you wanna join? And then of course we see what's happening with those that are crowding around the wall. DNC Days is really about us coming up with our versions of the future, what we feel is important and more importantly, what steps we need to take to get there. And so embracing bold new different ways to have these conversations, we're going to introduce you now to our headlines exercise. We do have a very um, distinguished panel here today that I will uh, first introduce one by one and then we'll get to the headlines. Um, if you could please turn on your cameras if they're not already there, uh, please to our panelists. We have Mike Adamson, the Chief Executive of the British Red Cross. Welcome very much, Mike. It's a pleasure to have you here today. We have Sonia Das from WAGO, which stands for the uh, Women in Informal Employment, Globalizing and Organizing. And I have to share this uh, short bio, if you don't mind, Sonia, where I've read you refer to yourself as a garbologist who specializes in solid waste management. You've had experience with municipal cleansing agency in Belo Horizonte, Brazil. You've done volunteer work supporting the organization of organizations of waste pictures. You've been engaged in social activism. And we look forward to hearing from you today on the theme of, um, of, of urban issues. We are also delighted to have Ms. Louise Cord here, who is Global Director of Social Sustainability and Inclusion at the World Bank, who will be providing a donor's perspective to our discussions today. We are also joined by Dan Collinson, Chief Executive of the NGO Farm Africa. Welcome, Dan. And we also have Rosemary Atieno, 
who's country lead for Kenya of the Women's Climate Centers International Group, which is a consortium of women-led organizations in Kenya, Uganda, Tanzania, South Africa, and the US. Um, these organizations are working with rural communities in livelihood support programs in water, sanitation, and hygiene, so WASH, reproductive health, food security, and women's leadership. And I hope that she will arrive in time. We have also invited, and um, hopefully she will be here, Ms. Ophelia Nubabare, who's founder of the Blessed Women's Group in Ghana, an NGO working with 20 women's groups um, who are also smallholder farmers in the upper western region of Ghana. So let's move on to the headlines now that we've introduced the panelists. If we could go to the next slide, please. Again, our key messages have been turned into headlines. So the next slide will show us, here we go. This is the early warning, early action theme. Hundreds of elderly citizens killed by a forecasted heat wave. We knew the heat wave was coming, but still, it led to major death and mortality. What can we do about this? Heat waves were a hot topic of discussion at uh, DNC days this year. Town council uses funding to develop early action plans linked to local flood early warning system. Here's a news headline, zero casualties from an unprecedented category 10 hurricane. Again, these are from 2030, zero casualties. Can we make this a reality? We already know we've made major progress in taking action early to avoid loss and damage, but is it enough? From the early warning, early action theme, forecast-based action is now used in every country of the world, exclamation point. Now, wouldn't that be a wonderful world? I would love to turn to you, Mike. Can you please share with us your reflections given you sit at the head of British Red Cross. What would this look like to you? What does this conjure up for you as a headline from 2030? Well, wouldn't that be amazing, Karina? Uh, thank you. And um, it's great to have a positive uh, headline to, to engage with. Um, and, you know, I was uh, up in Glasgow earlier in the week and able to attend with our Red Cross and Red Crescent colleagues the Loss and Damage Day. And I was very encouraged to hear a lot of the focus there on early action. And I'm also encouraged and positive because I see uh, in the work that we do both uh, here in the UK and around the world, you know, the impact that Red Cross and Red Crescent volunteers at community level are having uh, to help us to get ahead of, uh, of some of this. And it seems to me from what we've learned that the key to it is about being collaborative uh, in the way in which we approach um, uh, these challenges, but also being very, very intentional if we're serious about turning this into scalable donor uh, commitments. And as we've heard, you know, very uh, powerfully from Felix and Mercedes, you know, disasters are clearly much more predictable now than they were before. Um, but according to the estimates from the Risk and Early Action Partnership, you know, uh, there are still one in three people um, who um, uh, are not covered by early warning systems around disasters. And of course, it's a much smaller proportion of people again who are then um, uh, actually supported through early action uh, kind of protocols. And I think something you know, less than 1% of humanitarian financing is going into anticipatory action to make a difference in advance. But in a way, after, we have to be realistic, this is not a new problem. It's always been challenging to find funding for prevention uh, because people just it's, it seems to be human nature. But the problem is that the 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 uh, the failure to invest in prevention and anticipatory action now is the consequences are much greater than they were before because of the uh, climate growth. And it seems to me climate uh, change. And because it seems to me that part of the key is about how do we work in cross disciplinary ways, cross sectoral ways. This is not just about humanitarian issue. It's also we've got to engage development actors in realizing that um, resilience building is a development process itself, um, and that the threat to development gains if actually um, we don't invest in this kind of anticipatory uh, uh, funding and support. Um, I think in terms of where to start, the Risk-Informed um, Early Action Partnership hosted by the International Federation of Red Cross and Red Crescent Societies is a good place to start. We have an ambition um, that one billion people uh, should be safer from disasters. Um, by 2025 as, as a result of the work that we do in this kind of cross-disciplinary and cross-sectoral way across public, private and, uh, uh, public and private sectors, but also civil society. 
But even uh, being in Glasgow on uh, Sunday, Monday and listening to some of the debates, I could hear the different languages being used by different disciplines about the same issues. And we need to develop some common language. Um, I'm really grateful for the support that we're receiving from the British government to support some of the early action work that we're doing in Eswatini, Namibia and Niger um, and trying to mobilise finance before an emergency um, takes place. Um, but the key is, as we've heard from Felix and I said, is about community engagement because no point in even having the mon money if there isn't a way to get messages to a community. Uh, in ways that the community has said will work um, and um, that they are then able to act on and have actually uh, that so in a sense the early warning system is really very much designed by the community itself and you know there are both you know not so good examples and great examples it's you know it's clear that in uh, the response in uh, Mozambique to cyclone um, I die that some of the problems were around uh, the lack of trust in the way the information was coming and therefore a, a cyclone that was much worse than had happened before was not uh, responded to even though e the information was there and then there are other countries like bangladesh which just offer fantastic examples because of, of great success because bangladesh has been in the preparedness and resilience business for many many years long before it was accepted that climate change was the cause of many of the challenges we face and you will see you know, it, it, we saw in the response to Cyclone Amphan in uh, 2020, you know, two, nearly two and a half million people evacuated by 70,000 volunteers across 14,000 socially distanced uh, cyclone shelters uh, to get people into a safe place. And now we're adding in anticipatory finance to spot when uh, uh, a cyclone or flooding is likely to happen and getting funding to people uh, beforehand so that they aren't forced into a situation where their livelihoods are threatened and they have to sell assets um, or livestock or um, and animals. So I think the key is actually to build on uh, the, some of the momentum and great examples that we've got um, to form a common cause uh, with other disciplines, but also with other emergencies, not just about climate emergencies that these kind of capabilities will be useful for, uh, but other threats and early warnings that will come through around health threats or even or even earthquakes. And we've got to make prevention exciting um, so that people really want to, to invest in it um, and get ahead of the game. And I'll just finish with a quote from Secretary General of the Kenyan Red Cross, uh, who has with us, been with us this week, Dr. Asha Mohammed and said the only way we will win this race is if communities are front and centre and driving the adaptation agenda. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mike Adamson, for, for your words. You raised many, many points there. And of course, looking at this headline, staring, at us back, uh, staring back at us, forecast-based action is now used in every country in the world. And what is missing there is locally led action, which you spoke so much to, that that is the key. And of course, the, having trusted measures, uh, trusted messengers to deliver the information so that the actions can be taken is, is absolutely critical. Um, and I would say humanitarians being part of the conversation is a step forward to be here at COP and to be having initiatives such as REAP at the forefront of these conversations is, is already some progress. So thank you very much for your, for your reflections, Mike. If I can move on to the next slide and we'll continue on seeing what the headlines that were generated um, were. This next uh, theme is all about um, resilient cities. Successful heat action planning across the global south leads to most of the world finally understanding what Brian Adams was going on about. That's a mouthful. Does anybody, I mean, we all know Brian Adams, I would say, I see some smiles. I would guess this is about the summer of 69 where he had such a great time and this is um, probably even more likely to do with some good strong planning. We also have slum dwellers acknowledge that direct access to finance and knowledge helped them battle COVID-20 successfully. So we can see risks arising, not just climate risks, but also health risks and many other kinds of risks. And here we have Again, a theme that I'm sure resonates with many others, um, conversations on access to finance, access to knowledge. Urban resilience researchers, practitioners, and vulnerable communities are spotted mingling with each other as friends, gasp. Uh, 
Sonia Das, may I please ask you to reflect on any of the headlines, perhaps this one in particular, from where you're from where you sit. Oh, thank you. This is the best uh, headline for me. Uh, I was really happy to see that headline uh, because I cannot stress uh, well enough the importance of cross-collaborative research and cross-collaborative uh, implementation projects uh, with grassroots organizations, not for them, but with them, and especially research on the relationship between uh, climate change and livelihoods. I think it's very important to stress uh, the need for us to do more research and action on, on the direct and indirect impacts of, of climate change on livelihoods. We have seen reports in these two days events about uh, the impacts of uh, flash flooding on informal settlements, uh, the impacts on uh, on uh, heat waves and uh, and floods on individual on the individual way speakers, uh, be those who are working on sorting centers or working on streets, and it's very important that we do collaborative uh, research. Uh, which can help us identify both the direct and indirect uh, uh, impacts of climate change, because uh, it's important to raise what are, expose what are the structural vulnerabilities uh, underlying uh, the process that produce uh, poverty and inequality and how poverty uh, 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 the working poor and uh, informal settlements are affected by climate change. And I think it's also very important that we, we explore more in terms of research on, on the coping strategies that the working poor have, you know, because we, we need those as models, as examples for uh, policy makers to look for adaptation mechanisms that speaks to what is already there. And I think it's very important that we design policy, policy responses for climate change mitigations that do not cause further detrimental outcomes uh, on the poor and marginalized. And I cannot think of any other way of doing that then doing it collaboratively. collaboratively. In Brazil, uh, the work that we do uh, at WIGO, we've been engaged in many uh, engaged scholarship projects and interventions. One such uh, engaged scholarship uh, initiative is the Observatory for Inclusive and Solidarity uh, Recycling, which is a group of researchers from leading universities and from NGOs and networks like WIGU, practitioners and way speakers cooperatives who belong to the national movement of way speakers. And through this network, we've been doing collaborative research and intervention projects that help to document and also to implement initiatives like uh, zero waste initiatives, segregation at source systems in which the cities partner with cooperatives. Uh, we've been doing fundraising for waste speaker cooperatives to implement projects. So we are co-producing knowledge with and for way speakers and making it accessible with popular education materials. And I, I want to close just to bring you a few words from a way speaker from Bangalore. His name is Krishna and he, uh, he delivered a message on, uh, on for co-op 
uh, 26 that we published at the Global Alliance of Way Speakers. And Krishna says, uh, open inverted commas, if you want to know the problems we face due to climate change, we never know when there is going to be heavy rains, when it rains, and when it rains, our entire storage gets wet. And then we have to sell, we, we need to take this to the landfill. With all the difficulties, we still work for climate change and the environment, but our way speakers community have no facility for door to door collection. So we request to convert our factory facilities into uh, uh, user friendly uh, facilities for way speakers. So I think what uh, Krishna is saying here, it speaks to a number of uh, needs for the way speakers, such as prevention assistance and, and other infrastructure that they need. And it's only by doing cross collaboration, you know, cross collaborative research and interventions that we are going really uh, help uh, to link climate change action and livelihoods protection. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sonia. Very vivid examples. And I would say also at DNC Days discussed where this headline came out was, it was linked to the launch of the Adaptation Re Resilience or Adaptation Research Alliance um, that was just launched here at COP and really is about bringing researchers and communities together, making sure that we're closing the gaps and making sure that we're really ensuring those stories, those experiences that are being felt are informing the research. And you could even think of the IPCC now, which is all about peer reviewed literature, where are the community stories that are informing such processes. So we'll see much more hopefully in this direction. Um, of, of bridging these gaps. Thank you very much, Sonia. And we'll move on to our next slide now, our next theme, climate finance. And we are so happy to have you, Louise, to speak to the headlines. Let's go to the next slide and we'll run through them. Large scale debt swaps for climate and nature can tackle the post pandemic debt crisis. Government decisions over spending and taxes should cover gender and climate together. So here we hear uh, integrated approaches. Again, another common theme. And business can be managed to lift farmers out of, I have a backup copy here, to lift farmers out of poverty and increase their resilience to climate. Locally led adaptation can reduce humanitarian conflicts. So again, we're coming back to this idea of locally led. Ms. Louise Cord, please, the floor is yours. We'd love to hear your thoughts on this headline and even what the bank is doing to ensure that we place communities at the center of our work. Great, thank you so much. It's really a pleasure to be here. Good afternoon, good evening to everyone, depending where you may be on this wonderful planet and where you're connecting from. It's a real pleasure to be back at DNC Days. It's always a fun part and an important part and of, of the COP that focuses on what we care about, which is development and climate. I love these headlines, especially the positive one. I'd have to say I want to edit mine and say locally led climate adaptation reduces humanitarian conflicts because it can reduce has the idea of a potential. And I want to put myself on the second page right below Michael, because I do follow very much um, what he's talking about and with a focus on locally led action. So let me just take this theme a little further and break it down before I go into my, my little explanation. Let me give you the topic sentences of my article, since that's what we're talking about here in the newspaper. So I have five topic sentences that I would, would lead off on. The first is not new to you guys. Adaptation is key for poverty reduction and key for poor and vulnerable populations who will see their livelihoods impacted and face challenges on migration. Second headline would be, the challenge, though, of adaptation finance is how you get those resources to the local level. I remember at the COP in Madrid, we talked about the challenges of and how getting money down to the communities and how little money actually reaches down there that's designated for adaptation. So what's the vehicles that we have? Third, can we do that not only in a way that gets the money to the communities, but look at how we're doing that in a way that builds voice, 
builds on indigenous knowledge and makes builds participation across groups in the community. This will not only avoid, this not only, and I have to use the present tense since I changed my article, this is not only avoiding humanitarian disasters from climate change, building capacity for resilience and adaptation, but it also builds social cohesion and risk and ability to handle risks. This creates a virtuous cycle. The more you get groups together in a positive participatory way, the more you have social cohesion, the more social cohesion, the more you come together to take collective action when you're faced with climate risks, such as water shortages, um, heat waves and so forth and flooding. And then finally, my fifth headline is the World Bank is a major player on the finance side. I guess who else to ask on a finance section, but the World Bank. Let me just go a bit more detail and a little bit more granularity on my, my headlines. So. The World Bank gave in this year $26 billion of climate finance. We're one of the largest multilateral financers of climate and two thirds of and that provided two thirds of overall adaptation finance went through the World Bank. This is going to continue as the World Bank has committed to give at least 35% of our own overall financing this time to climate action in the next, um, in the next five years and half of that is going to support adaptation. But as I said, that's great, having money at scale for adaptation, which you know, I feel very fortunate this is resources, but how do you get those down to the local level? And how do you do that in a way that builds voice? Well, in the World Bank, we're drawing on community-led development, something that we've been doing for many years. We have a longstanding total portfolio of 30 billion in this area over time. It's something that started in fragile states where the and fragile situations where there was very little local capacity for service delivery and relatively weak governments, but now has expanded to being a central tool for locally led climate uh, finance because it gives resources directly to communities and to local governments, gives them voice in how they're gonna be used and, and actually a role and leadership in implementing them and brings together groups at the community level to solve solutions and to work together and build social cohesion, which as I said, is so central for resilience. So how is this done? How have we done this? Project ongoing now, Horn of Africa, 2.6, let me get the right number. 2.5 million refugees that have been traveling throughout the Horn, have facing challenges from pastoral and agro-pastoral livelihoods, and also challenges integrating with host communities in a very fragile, as you can imagine, ecosystem. And so the bank's project development response to displacing impacts project in Djibouti, Ethiopia, Kenya, and Uganda provides resources to support sustainable environment and natural resource management with soil and water interventions, renovation and rejuvenation of indigenous species of grasses and trees, and introduction of alternative energy sources. And this is being done using the CDD, Community Driven Development Framework of Participation and Community Action, bringing together host communities and refugees, building this very critical social cohesion. We're also just really thrilled that this week, I think many of you may already know, at the COP, we had launched um, the Kenya Locally Led Climate Adaptation Project, which is $250 million for Kenya to support locally led action on climate and, and resilience and adaptation, building on local voices, building on local risk monitoring systems. And I was really glad to see the explanation and the, the work being done in Nicaragua and hear from Mercedes and Felix, because it's those kinds of systems we need to ensure are in our projects to make sure we have the early warning systems, the information for action to build on the local knowledge for climate action and to communicate that effectively to, to governments at the central level. So there's coordinated action. So we are hope the Kenya project is just launched. As I said, this week, we're gonna be following this intervention plus our intervention on the horn and others that we have to learn from this so that we can scale up radically our work on climate adaptation and in the next three years and deliver on our commitment and finance and avoid humanitarian conflicts. So thank you for your attention and um, really look, enjoy being part of this day. Thanks. Back Thank you. you so much, Louise. And it's actually really quite a pleasure. We last had you at Development and Climate Days in Madrid when we were in person. And so thank you for making time your schedule here. Of course, 
Um, the Kenya local led action project is fascinating also with its potential to be able to be taken to scale in other countries where you really are placing um, decision making power at the county level. And so I think that's one that we're going to keep our eye on and see how it develops further. And hopefully next year at DNC Days, you can come back and share some initial results. Um, but of course, getting the financing to the local level is one of the greatest challenges that we're also seeing slowest progress being made, uh, quite frankly, at, at COP26 as well, is um, making sure the money reaches the local level and what that looks like. So thank you for sharing your experiences with us today. Now, agriculture and food. This is an interesting photograph of how we're wrapping uh, food in a newspaper. Um, I would like to pass the floor on. Uh, well, actually, let's look at the headlines first. Um, next slide, please. Climate crisis, millions of hungry African farmers are in urban slums. Next slide, please. Just thinking about that. African farmers in urban slums. Farming without nature, how impacting, how it's impacting the food on our shelves. How do we farm without nature? Again, this is all reflecting conversations we've had at the DNC Day sessions under this theme. Transformation of food systems at the center of climate solutions at COP35. My initial thought is do we have to wait for COP35 another 10 years or so down the line to be talking about this front and center. And then last, indigenous communities leading the way on climate resilient food systems globally. What would that look like? Rosemary, I turn to you, Rosemary Atieno, please. Which headline resonates with you and which speaks to your experience? Maybe you could say a little bit about what's happening and what we need more of to avoid these catastrophic headlines or achieve some, some good by 2030 and beyond. Rosemary, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much for everybody. We have nicer information coming out. And uh, I also don't want to be different from the rest. I always look at things in a positive manner. Uh, uh, I'm happy that uh, we are all working towards trying to achieve our great goals in terms of climate change and responding to climate challenges that are facing our people. Uh, I want to talk a lot about indigenous communities leading the way on climate resilient food systems globally and uh, in all the contexts of, uh, of our production systems. Uh, we all realize that um, for us to respond effectively to climate change, indigenous communities are at the center of everything. We are people who know really what we want. We know how to cope. And uh, we have lived with all these challenges for quite a number of time. So we have uh, a lot to bring onto the table in terms of food security and in terms of having uh, healthy lives. Uh, we need to have our communities at the center of everything that we do. And at uh, Women Climate Centers, I want to just share a small brief, is that uh, we believe in tapping into the indigenous knowledge that is really available within the community systems. We want to believe in research being combined with indigenous knowledge to be able to give us the results that we are really looking for. Uh, we are saying that uh, we want to train women and communities to learn by doing. So we want to transmit knowledge by doing. We don't really just want to talk, but we want to give hands-on experience to our community members. We have seen our women come up because they have the strength of forming groups that are able to be used to transfer information, that can be used to transfer knowledge, that can be used for sharing. And I want to be very categorical in saying that um, everybody loves being appreciated. The only way you can appreciate our indigenous communities is by in, uh, uh, embracing the knowledge that they have, by embracing the information that they have that can lead us to the resilient food systems that we are looking for. We realize that millions of lands are being destroyed, our forests are being destroyed, yet our indigenous communities are still farming on their small pieces of land and are actually providing food for our communities. So I want to say that um, we need to get a message to our people we need to share with them uh, because they know, really know what really works. And we are saying that we are all already locked up in this. We cannot do anything. Up, the, our generation is already locked up in this. We can only do this for our next generation. We are saying that uh, local knowledge in the agriculture systems is really building a lot into the food systems. And uh, if we continue 
providing the support that is required. We continue dialoguing with our communities as required. I see us having a uh, transformation in the food systems come 2030 or COP35 that we are talking about. But we are saying that we need to really move fast and act very fast in this because time is not on our side. And one way of us sir, acting on this is that uh, we really need to try and see how we can build food secure systems. And the only way we can do this is by ensuring that the local resources that are being provided to governments, being provided to other NGOs, reach the local community people so that they're able to use it in the local knowledge that they have to transfer more information to other people that are around them. We are saying, can we work together as a team and ensure that the resources reach these people in a timely manner, the information reaches these people in a timely manner, and information that is simple to understand and easy to understand, so that we are able to cope up with the uh, efficient farming systems, we are able to cope up with the floods and the droughts, the only way we can do this is by combining the local knowledge with the current knowledge on, uh, on farming systems. So we, when we use this, I think we should be able to transform the systems that are there and be able to put healthy food on our tables so that we farm with nature. Currently, we are farming without nature. We are talking about uh, GMOs. We are not looking at the nature that is around us so that it is able to continue giving us good and organic food. So I want to say that... Uh, we need to regenerate our systems, look at our coping mechanisms so that uh, we do not continue losing lives. We need to continue researching a lot on food systems and uh, bring in the local knowledge on the fore and continue dialoguing with our communities, continue talking to them and continue sharing the knowledge that we have to build more resilient food systems. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rosemary. Lots of similar themes coming up. I mean, you hear you mentioned bringing researchers together to communities, of course, leading the way with local action, of course, prioritizing indigenous knowledge, combining it with, let's say, the uh, technical scientific knowledge, and of course, ensuring the local sector. Thank you very much, Rosemary, for your for your reflections. Now we have one more set of headlines to present to all of you. And this is on our final theme, nature-based solutions. And we're delighted to have Dan Collinson to be here to reflect on these. Let's go through them first, once again. Next slide, please. There we go. Unprecedented migration and death following droughts. Green infrastructure overtakes gray infrastructure in a slightly more positive headline. And nature trashed as local organizations are ignored. Let those sink in a bit. Think about conversations you've had could have led to these the headlines, work that you're doing, what you're seeing that could lead to this or not. Next slide, please. And here's a positive one. Small farms now saving the world. Dan, would you like to comment on this from your position as head of Farm Africa? Thanks, Karina. Hi, everybody. It's nice to be part of this event. Um, and my comments on nature-based solutions, I think, follow on very well from our, what Rosemary was saying about sustainable and locally-led, locally-based food systems. Um, that headline on, uh, by the way, I really like them. I, like, I love the, the headlines approach that you've taken. That one on, on migration is quite chilling. And I think it's... Um, quite a real scenario, isn't it? I, I've been thinking about it a lot over the last few days because there's a very disturbing and powerful story going on at the moment about um, migrants who are trapped between Belarus and Poland in, in Eastern Europe. And a lot of them are coming from Iraqi Kurdistan and from Eastern Iraq. And there's all sorts of reasons, as we know, why people move. But one of the drivers is that conditions in eastern Iraq are getting really intolerable. The summer heat there is worse every year and it's getting harder and harder for people to live and farm and survive in parts of the world. And I think that that is a headline um, that we could see um, in, in several years time, 2020, I can't remember when the, when the headline was 
was billed, but 10, 15, 20 years time. Um, but I do like the, the focus here on, on small scale agriculture. I don't think that small farms can save the world. Um, or certainly small small holder farmers can save the world, but I'm, I say I think they shouldn't have to either. Um, the the African continent is responsible for about 2.8% of carbon emissions ever. And to expect that smallholder farmers hold the key to sort of um, saving the rest of us, I think is putting a lot onto, um, onto the shoulders of um, some of the, 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 the poorest communities in the world. Five out of every six farms in the world are are categorized as small farms. That means they're, they're less than two hectares. Um, and globally, they produce about a third of, a third of all the food we grow or, or produce. And in Africa, the, 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 the proportion is quite a bit higher. Smallholder farms produce about 70% of all food. So they're really, really important, not only in achieving food security, um, but also in protecting the environment. The, the, one of the big challenges, the yield gap on farms, on, and, include, and that includes on smallholder farms, is, is sub substantially below the potential of existing farmland to, to produce. Um, so the challenge is to, is to intensify production in sustainable ways, but on an existing land footprint, rather than extending the agricultural frontier onto, into forests, onto rangelands, um, and it's possible. It's possible through to, to do it in a in a nature positive way, using nature based solutions, um, and using climate smart agriculture and regenerative approaches. If if we get it right, then these approaches can improve soil quality. They can reduce food loss. About 30% of all food grown in Africa actually doesn't make it to market because um, it, it, the market because it's um, markets too unpredictable. Transport links aren't strong enough. Um, the post harvest handling uh, fails. Um, it can be achieved through payment for ecosystem services. We've seen a huge. I've, um, focus at COP this week on 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 carbon trading and carbon credits and the both the benefits of that and the enormous pitfalls. But certainly, payment for ecosystem services as um, farmers and forest dwellers are rewarded and incentivized to um, protect the environment that they live in, which is the global good, through nature-based solutions um, have a lot of potential to help that to help those communities be part of the solution um, and alongside that predictable markets and the important role of small and medium-sized enterprises in promoting the efficiency and the productivity of small farms all have a potential not only as i said to to promote food security food security but to do it in a way that helps us to preserve environments um, like Rosemary said, these nature-based solutions are not a new idea. That's how most people have farmed always. But they're certainly lis listening around the, 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 the rooms and the, 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 the side events and even the main events at COP this week, even though agriculture wasn't one of the themes, nature-based solutions is certainly an idea whose time has come in terms of the, the language of development what donors are interested and the range of solutions that we have to tackle these big problems. One um, minute. So very, very much in evidence this week. Um, we've got great examples of nature-based solutions working that we've looked at at the DNC days this week through, from Red Plus and co -op, um, participatory forest management to regenerative agriculture and local seed banks. Um, but they, those, just to go back to the headline, those, those approaches by themselves can't save the world. We need to decarbonize. And I think that's, the, you know, that's becoming more and more clear at, and, and is a big, big theme coming out of COP26. 
it's controversial for some stakeholders, but it seems to me to be um, the number one thing that needs to happen. But smallholder farms are definitely part of the solution. Thank you very much, Dan. Excellent. And um, also a glimpse into your world, into working with smallholder farmers in Africa, which may not be where all of us have our technical expertise. But really, I think the question that, that you raised are questions that we could all ask ourselves in the different thematic areas we work on. Who's responsible for taking action and who's accountable? How are we holding the decision makers, the action takers to account? So you mentioned small farms should not be saving the world. They have a vital role to play. And, and then who should be? We see what's going on at COP. We see now where progress is not being made. And we have heard in this session where there is so much potential and there is so much progress being made at the local level. There's just more need for resources, more need for voice, I would say, to be part of these discussions. Thank you so much, Dan, for your Thank reflections. You. And if we move on to the next slide, I, I feel it's important here to just take, take a moment. And we've talked about the needs to turn words into action. We started Development and Climate Days with this cartoon. And we've talked about the need to act, the need for many more things that sometimes are just frustrating. We, we talk and we've heard these aren't new solutions. We aren't coming with new things that have never been mentioned before. In many cases, we know what needs to be done. It's just not happening often enough or at scale or with the urgency that's needed. So here you see the cartoon that says that won't bring the rain we need. That's just a rain cloud and what participants in the opening plenary commented on when they saw that. Well, if we take a reality check and we see where we stand now, we see that COP is not yet delivering enough. We see that we have endorsements ringing loudly on locally led adaptation, locally led action. This hasn't made it yet into the COP text. We have seen many millions contributed to the adaptation fund and to adaptation in general, that's not enough. We don't see loss and damage being tackled enough either. That's also not mentioned in the current text. The race to resilience is going strong. It's looking to build resilience of up to 2 billion people through non-state action. We have greater calls for adaptation, balancing out the attention and finance for mitigation. So clearly there's still a lot to be done. And as I said, we do know a lot of what is needed and we do know how to get there. Now. This is a moment for all of you to think about what we've talked about here in DNC days, what you've heard over the last two days and what we know is happening in the negotiating halls where not enough progress is being made despite often the answers being clear, being able to be captured in headlines of what will happen if things go catastrophically wrong and we don't take action now, as well as what could happen if we did make wise choices, make choices where we respect local communities and really empower those with knowledge to take things forward. So what I would like to invite all of you to do now is to consider what do we need more of that's working? What can we build on to enhance the solidarity that already exists, to, great, to, to make that greater? And how do we really reach communities and how do we really, can we really do our work better together? This is a place for us to think about new ideas, maybe commitments, pledges, what we would like to, say as individuals, as organizations, and really take the energy that's been generated at DNC Days, talk about it in a small group, share your thoughts, get going, warm up a little bit, and then we'll come back to plenary and we'll see, we'll just do popcorn style, who would like to share what you feel really must be taken forward from this meeting today, given we have many of the answers, it's just not being done often fast enough. So with this, I would like to ask everybody to, um, please accept the invite to go into a breakout room. We'll have about a um, short five, 10 minutes, and then we'll come right back for a quick plenary reflection before we move on to closing remarks. Okay, great. It looks like we're coming back and that was a very short breakout. I imagine some conversations were cut off, apologies for that, but we will be sharing more now in plenary. Um, even if they were not fully polished, not fully formulated, thoughts, it would be great to hear from all of you. What, what must we do now? What do you commit to do? What are ideas that you'd like to raise here in the plenary before we, we close off and continue on doing our work and, and meeting again? One other thought to think of that may um, spark some ideas. 
what's the role in D of DNC days in all of this? What's the role of the resilience hub? We have so many things that are coming out now. Um, in terms of action, we all want to be working cross sectorally and together and learning and focusing on locally led action. How can we do this better moving forward as a community, but then also at a, at a more global level? So it's an open conversation. Who would like to go first? A silent bunch. I imagine your breakouts were not silent. I'll go to Bettina first and then to Joe. All right, our breakout was very lively and then we got cut off just when we got to, to the interesting part. And basically, I think we can summarize that we said, actually, uh, we need to really change gear and do things very differently. And uh, we thought specifically two things. The one is really abolish short-term funding cycles because it really um, is very, very challenging to maintain processes that are very meaningful on the local level. And uh, um, to really think much more long-term and the second one, and we're just about to uh, discuss how we're going to do it, is to abolish projects and to really reimagine how we can work without projects. I think projectified worlds are part of the problem um, of what we're dealing with. That's it from our site. Uh, and I don't know uh, uh, if I should disclose who is in my group, but if you, if you know who you are, if you want to add anything, please feel free. Or just wave. Um, thanks very much, Bettina. <laughs> I see some waves going on. And yeah, timelines. I mean, we're talking here about abolishing, you know, phasing out coal in 2050, 2070. And many of the leaders that are in power now aren't even going to be in power when that year is upon us. And so timelines are really quite, quite objective, aren't they? Did Joe, would you like to take the floor? Maybe you could introduce yourself as well. Hi, I'm Dijo. Yeah, so I'm a junior researcher at the Climate Center and postgrad at the University of Cape Town. Yeah, so I in, in our group, I think personally as an artist, I was thinking that one of the ways we can carry on this conversation is bringing in the, a lot more um, artistic expressions of all the stuff we've spoken about and making this message kind of very accessible. And then people actually owning the, the message so that they become champions, the community, the artists, the average person on the streets. You know, so that was one. And from my, from my group, um, we also had um, uh, feedback from regarding multi-hazard. So in, in case of going forward, when we are thinking about the early warnings, we shouldn't just look at maybe floods or something, but then it should be a multi-hazard kind of thing where it, the early warning is kind of has components of earthquake, wind, floods, and all that. So it it's kind of gives this um information so that people are, uh, are ready for great thanks so much to joe yes this idea of compound risk not just climate related extremes we're facing and not all one after another is it and Anne, i see your hand up from ied hi thanks karina um yeah my group was very small there was just two of us but um we kind of thought that uh looking at what's been discussed at DNC days and at COP more generally, thinking about the kind of bottom up communicating the needs of the communities and trying to get finance from the top down and how the best ways to do that are. Um, we, we kind of thought that, you know, personal relationships and, and, and interacting with people on a kind of, uh, on a personal level is, is really important. And I, and I kind of thought that that's one of the great things about DNC days as well, that, um, you know, some of us have been to quite a few DNC days, some of us are new, but but I think the thing that a lot of us get out of it is is that we are kind of communicating in, in a way that is feels more feels deeper, feels like we can um, be open. Uh, Pablo certainly encourages us to be emotional, and I think that that's really great, especially because climate change is such a, an emotional thing. Um, so yeah, so I think the the kind of personal relationships um, it is a really strong thing to have uh, going forward. Thanks, Anne. I mean, the humanity of it, right? Putting our faces here, turning our cameras on and feeling what we're feeling, be it despair or hope or frustration or laughter. I mean, that sounds trite, but it's also actually really important for how we, how we connect and work together on this. I have time for one more short 
and compelling, powerful nugget insight that anybody here would like to share. I'm sure there are many, but just time for one. So in our group, when we just started the discussion, then time was over, we were breaking back to the main meeting. So we generally talked about uh, our interest is farming and the community at the center of everything that we do. And uh, we felt that uh, we needed to have community always being respected. We needed to feel that community really needed to be involved because locally led adaptations is the way for us to go. So any complex information that is supposed to reach our communities needs to be demystified so that they really understand it, so that we avoid the big jargons if we are to bring them on board in order to save in as much as they have a lot on their plate, but uh, there are a key direction in which we could really save the planet in terms of food security. So we said we need to have a lot of dialogues and we feel that more funds need to get down to the grassroots communities so that we are able to do more, we are able to share more. And you know, communities feel appreciated when you really share their stories out, their testimonials out. So that's what we felt and the time cut us out, but that's our great feeling as food producers. Thank you so much, Rosemary. And, and it does come down to a great extent, maybe more than we think to choice. How can we choose what we do next in a way, as yeah. I mentioned, it's respectful and that keeps the priorities in order? What's, what's yeah. happening? So for us, we'll continue advocating for communities and giving them information. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rosemary. I see in the chat, Anne from IID is asking if we get a screen grab of the whole group with cameras on. If you can, please turn your camera on. One quick picture and then we'll pass on to Andy who's been so patiently waiting. And we are really pleased he'll be here to give closing remarks. Big smiles, everybody. DNC days. <laughs> Virtual edition is almost at an end. Andy, I'll pass over to you, please. The floor is yours. Thank you so much, Karina. And uh, yeah, being at the COP site, haven't had a chance to engage as much as I would have liked, but it's been fantastic to see everything that's going on. And just let me say quickly, because there's not a huge amount of time, um, this is such an important event. And I think one of the things that struck me over the years, I've been observing it and working with IAID, is the influence that Development Climate Days has had um, although we may not have reached the point we wanted to get to, as you were saying, Karina, in terms of what's in the COP text or the famous 100 billion that still hasn't been delivered, which should have been, it is really striking to see how themes that were really born in this community are now so strong. 70 organizations signing up to the principles for locally led adaptation. We've seen at COP lots of uh, commitments to organizations, to, well, to initiatives that I think have a solid locally led character, like uh, I've seen Lu Louise Cordon, uh, Flocker, um, the, the Kenyan Devolved Climate Finance Initiative, uh, that's very close to our heart in IID, having worked in that space for a long time, but many others as well. And some breakthrough moments, like um, it's very small amount of money, it's a million um, pounds, but the Scottish government committing funding to loss and damage the first time. Uh, this is again something that DNC Days brought into the debate to a very large extent, and particularly Salim al Haq, the sort of um, really the founder of DNC Days. So that's fantastic. But we've also seen some other breakthroughs in terms of the discourse of the large organizations, the 1.75 billion for indigenous peoples and local communities in the forest space. We have to see how that will work. Will it be genuinely locally led? Will it be genuinely accountable? Will it do what it says on the tin? But, you know, things have changed. And above all, I think the realization that you can't do the whole piece around climate change, including tackling mitigation, tackling emissions without climate justice and without delivering on effective locally led adaptation um, of the, the kind of narratives that really develop, development climate days were first in the field with those narratives. And it's been so important to do that. The other thing I love is that DNC days can be an energizing and positive space in um, a world where there are many things that feel very, very challenging about the climate emergency, not least that um, 
Karina, you were picking out things that aren't yet there in the COP decision text, but we shouldn't forget that we don't have 1.5 unambiguously in the COP text. So it's great that countries are asked to come back and raise their ambition, but it's against the Paris targets. So there's lots of advocacy and lots of work to do um, because we need that target and we need that uh, commitment, which still isn't there. But DNC also has been about much more than finance. Just a few final words, particularly about justice, inequality, tackling power relations across, you know, the full range of issues of intersectional disadvantage, gender, race, caste, um, all other aspects of that. And fighting for rights and fighting for um, the ability of communities to preserve their culture, which in turn particularly with indigenous peoples, preserves nature and works well for the planet and voice as well, um, which you mentioned, Karina. So those are my thoughts. This is a really important forum. Um, doing it online has been different, and but also incredibly important to keep that tradition and that spirit going. So thank you very much indeed. And but again, thank you very much, Andy. We know also how busy you've been just coming from a meeting in the negotiations to be here and to really put perspective to DNC Days, what our contribution has been. Next year will be the 20th anniversary of our event, and we've got always much more work to do. Maybe um, thanks. It was an absolute pleasure. Thank you very much, Karina. <laughs> this was, cartoon was meant to be shown before you spoke, Andy. Things happen, we improvise. This is a cartoon to leave all of you with. And you mentioned, Annie, a positive space, energizing space that we strive to be here. And I suppose the, the pictures speak for themselves. Let's try and flip the balance and reverse it and keep, keep the good work going. If we go to the last slide, um, we do have a massive team that was behind Development and Climate Days, all the way up from Andy, Norton, Claire Shakya, Martin Van Als, Margaret Arnold, Nate Matthews, Sylvie, um, Wabis Kandoti, and Lizzie Whitehead with the steering group. You'll see all of these names. I can't promise we haven't missed people because it's been a gargantuan effort, especially doing it for the first time behind the scenes. Major thanks to Storytile, who's put together the DNC Days platform for us and have been fabulous at answering any tech questions and getting right on it when something needed fixing. And um, one final piece of housekeeping, I would say, all of the cartoons that you've seen over the last two days are going to be made available to all of you. Please check back on the DNC Days website. These are freely available for use, for not profit use, I should say. And we encourage you to help use them to get messages across. We've found them very powerful this year at COP. And also please, before you sign off and go off into the distance to follow the rest of COP and do what happens um, after DNC Days ends, a survey will be shared with all of you, with all the participants of DNC Days. We really would value your feedback on what the virtual DNC Days experience was for you, how we can continue to improve. And I saw really interesting uh, feedbacks and reflections in the chat as well about space for DNC Days moving forward. So these are very, very much um, welcomed and we take them all very seriously. So please do take the time if you can. Otherwise, we have a couple minutes left. I don't dare end late, but we're a little early. Anybody would like to say a final word before we end? Otherwise, what- How I about we do a little connection exercise now, exactly. Karina, before we end? Please, all right, cool. over to you, Bettina. I've, I've spoken enough. Let's, let's have Bettina close the show for us. All right, um, so this is an applied improv exercise that we would like to encourage you all to do. It'll only work if you have your camera on. So uh, if you can manage to do this, that's great. If you can't, we hope you can still enjoy it. So if you do your hands like this and you don't, you will not touch anyone in person. So don't worry, it's culturally hopefully compatible. Um, then you decide if you put your hand to the one side or the other, and you might have it mirrored or your hand might sort of be a bit blurry like mine, never mind, you know where you put it. And if and everyone sees the blocks in a different order, so there's no right or wrong, no one is going to check on you, you're self-organized. Um, if you do this and the person on that side that you see is also putting their hand to that side of the block, what you do is silently 
you do a total cheer as if your favorite soccer club has just scored a goal like this. Whatever you want, however you cheer. If there is no one, you do a very slow motion sad face. Okay, you got it? It really uh, works best if you show emotion. Pablo said, emotion is what makes us learn better. So here is a chance to connect. Hopefully, we'll do it a couple of times. Uh, you look like, oh, you're very meditative, but are you ready? Ready? Obviously, if there's no one on your left side, it's kind of pointless to put the hand to the left. So be strategic about your decision making. And we hope you have neighbors everywhere. Are you ready? Ready, steady, and put your hand somewhere. And your emotion, I can see some cheers. Quite a few cheers. All right. Next round. A chance for some of us. Are you ready? Steady. You can do the same or different. Go. Cool. I can see a lot of cheering. Uh, if you have a sad face, we learn from failure. So thank you so much. Last one, and this is the final one. All good things come in threes, as they say in German. You can also do both. That will maximize your chances. So ready, steady, and go. <laughs> and with this, hopefully, really positive emotions, Karina, I hand over to you to send us off. Thank you. Thank you very much, everybody. It was wonderful to see you all. High ending. Let's hope for the best at COP. Have a wonderful rest of the day, evening. Bye-bye. We'll be in touch. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.